And so I'm going to be uh, very excited to have this uh, little gathering, and I think people will be joining us um, as we're moving along in our meeting. Um, and we're just going to read in alphabetical order by last name, starting with Glenn, and I'll introduce everybody, and, and then they, they'll, they'll take it over for about 10 minutes or so. And all of these uh, meetings will be recorded and posted on YouTube. So you can actually share them on your website. You can embed them on your website. You can share them with friends and they'll be there forever on, on our uh, new YouTube channel. So uh, everybody ready? And, and I would ask everybody to mute themselves except for the readers so that uh, we don't have the ambient noise uh, of 20 people or, or whoever, 25 people who are joining us um, on, on the call. Uh, so I'll start with, start with Glenn Blake. So Glenn is the author of Drowned Moon, Return Fire, and The Old and the Lost, and has been a senior editor at Boulevard Magazine. His short stories have appeared in American Short Fiction, Boulevard Southwest Review, The Hopkins Review, and Gulf Coast. Born and raised in Liberty on the Trinity, Glenn taught in the English department at Rice University, the creative writing program at the University of Houston, and the writing seminars at John Hopkins. Glenn, it's all yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sergio, for organizing this great event. And uh, if, I don't know if Carmen's there, I wanted to say hello to Carmen for her kindness. I'm truly honored to be in such august company. And uh, to my fellow inductees, I look forward to meeting you next year in El Paso, if not sooner. Uh, also, I hope the five who preceded us two weeks ago are listening. And I wanted to tell you that I'm truly, genuinely, sincerely blown away by your readings. And I've been sending the last two weeks trying to order your books. So uh, reading for eight to 10 minutes, if you, you, you may not know my stories and why should you? They're about 30 or 40 pages long. And so this would be a sprint. I liken this to uh, as Sergio said, teaching for 10 years at Rice and 10 years at the University of Houston, three hour seminars. When they hired me at Johns Hopkins, I, like everyone else, are now teaching for 45 or 50 minutes. And so I had a colleague say, my God, Glenn, that must be dreadful. And I said, dude, you have no idea. And he goes, what do you mean? And I said, you know, I have digressions that are 50 minutes long. So, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a chapter of the novel I've been working on for about 10 years about Texas history. Uh, uh, I'm going to read the second chapter just to get you caught up. The protagonist is learned about the death of his father. He's flown from Baltimore to Houston, taken a cab down 225 to the battleground at uh, San Jacinto, San Jacinto, and he's shocked to find the battlefield underwater. He leaves the cab, he takes off, his shoes and socks and wades across the battleground to the ferry landing at, San, at uh, Lynchburg. And across the channel and across the bay is the subdivision called De Gallo, from De Gallar to cut in the throat, the great Gatsby homes. So the second chapter. Where's your car? I hear him before I see him. I'm walking down battleground road, my pants wet, my shoes and my hand, when he hits me with the spotlight and shouts, where's your car? In Baltimore, I shout back, shielding my eyes. You walked in from Baltimore, did you? I can see him now, standing up in the tower at the top of the ladder in the door of the wheelhouse. I flew in, I say. I flew into Hobby. I stop at the landing. The chain is up. Painted on each side of the tower is the word Lynch. That's quite a hike in itself, he says. What is that, 25, 30 miles? 20, I say. I can see him leaning on the banister, both hands resting on the railing, the life preserver on his left side, the spotlight on his right. Permission to come aboard. Not just yet, he says. There is exactly one laughing go on each of the posts of the landing, not just yet. I could step over this chain, I say, and I could blow your ass back, he says, and the gulls 
scores of them laugh hysterically. I could blow your ass all over this boat. Do you threaten every passenger who walks up? That's just it, he says. I ain't never had a passenger just walk up. You're my first, and look at you, barefooted. You say you just flew into town, you ain't got no luggage. And what did you do in your britches? Son, we don't have any facilities on board. The gulls erupt in a chorus of guffaws. Will you take me across? What time is it, he says. A quarter till six, I say. 5.43, 17 minutes, he says. In 17 minutes, he says. He turns off the spotlight, steps into the wheelhouse and closes the door. What happened, I say. What, he says. He removes our moorings and we embark. Each and every last goal takes flight to escort us. They take turns diving into the froth of our wake. The battleground, I say. What about it, he says. It's underwater, I say. Sunk, he says. He is a small man, wiry, burned down one side of his body. One half of his face looks like it has melted, his right arm withered, his right eye white. It's sunk, he says. This whole part of the country sunk. He looks at me with his good eye. Subsidence, they call it. Subsided some 10 feet this century. The refineries up the channel are to blame. They keep pumping out the groundwater. We keep sinking. He is wearing a captain's cap. Are you the captain? I say the pilot. I look up to the dark windows of the wheelhouse. I mean, is there someone up there steering this thing? Oh, you'll get there, he says. He is smiling. If I was you, I'd start worrying about what's waiting for me on the other side. He points into the wake, and I see the dark dorsals and the white froth, dolphins, sharks. I put my shoes on, he says, and I tie my laces tight. He takes off toward the bow, a slight limp in his gait, and I take off after him. Why, I say. He is standing at the bow, looking out over the water. What? I don't think you know where you're going, he says. I don't think you know what's waiting for you. It is almost dawn, and I look to the light in the east and see what he sees, not a sunrise, not a sun coming up, but a fire, a big fire burning on the far shore. What do you want, he says, to get to the other side, I say. <laughs> when the gods want to punish you, he says, they answer your prayers. Now you understand me, I'm taking you across. I'm taking you to the other side. He takes off his cap and waves it in the air and the scores of gulls cry. But me and my gulls, he says, we ain't waiting. We ain't waiting for you. We're going back. Do you understand? I understand, I say. There's nothing out there, he says. There's no one out there anymore. No one, I say. No one in his right mind, he says. De Guayo, he says. It's a song. It was a song. They played it at the Alamo. He points across the water. It used to be a real show place. The country club section of town, all the oil executives lived out there, big houses, big homes. I know, I say. But not anymore, he says. Most of those houses are out in the water now. Most of those homes are out in the bay. What happened to the people, I say? What happened to the families? Most of the old families died off, I say. Most of them moved away. Are they all gone? They ain't all gone, he says. I think there's some holdouts, but I shit you not. Their asses are out in the water. Their asses are out in the bay. They park their cars on the levee road and take boats to their houses. The city shut the place down, barricaded the entrances, cut off the utilities. So there might be someone living in those homes, but like I said, no one 
in his right mind. It is dawn when the ferry reaches the other side. Each and every last laughing gull lands just long enough for us to ease into the landing, for him to lower the chain, for me to step onto the shore before the ferry drifts back into the channel and they all take flight again. Last chance, he says, the ferry drifting farther. He reaches out with his good arm. Thanks for the ride, I say. He shakes his head, lifts the chain, shouts across the water. You won't like what you find, he shouts. Do you know what's waiting for you? Do you know what's over there? And I say, not loud enough for him to hear me, I say, home. That's it. Bravo. Thank you, Glenn. Is that it? That's it. Okay, thank you. That was terrific. Wow. Can't that, wait to read it. How far along are you in the novel? Uh, I am right at the end of the fourth draft, and uh, it's about time to wrap it up. Everyone's dead. So I feel like I'm at the end of uh, Hamlet, just stepping over bodies at this point. But, uh, but it's all about uh, Texas history and... Uh, uh, the indigenous peoples of the Gulf Coast. So. Oh, I definitely, I want to read it. Can't okay. wait till it's out. Okay, well, good. Thank you very much, Sergio. Thank you, Glenn. Um, so next up, Kathleen Kent. Uh, her fifth book, The Burn, um, was, was a sequel to the Edgar-nominated The Dime. It's a contemporary crime novel set in Dallas and published in 2020. She also wrote three best-selling award-winning historical novels, the Heretic's Daughter, The Traitor's Wife, and The Outcast. Her short stories and essays have been published in D Magazine, Texas Monthly, Crime Reads, Lit Hub, and Dallas Noir. Kathleen? Thank you, Sergio. Thank you so much for setting this up. I know we were all disappointed that due to circumstances beyond our control, we couldn't come together in a, in a big gathering but I'm, I'm certainly very appreciative that you set this up. I listened to the readers last a few weeks ago and as Glenn said, they're phenomenal, just so moving, so wonderful. I'm, I am deeply touched to be included in this group and I wanted to thank you Sergio and Carmen and everyone else who, who supported me and, and uh, supported my induction and I'm thrilled to be in this company, thank you. Welcome. I'm going to be reading um, from my third historical novel, The Outcast, which is set in Texas a few years after the Civil War, it's set in 1870. And um, it's a story about a buried treasure and uh, the search for uh, a killer and um, sort of the hero's journey for a young Native American man who joins the newly formed Texas State Police Force and he finds himself in Texas in a country, a universe far, far away from his home. So I'm going to read uh, the prologue, which is very short, to kind of set it up. And then I'm going to read just part of the second chapter. And I think it will explain, pretty much explain the, the story. So this is from the prologue. For a thousand years, the northern windward side of the island lay fallow. The sand tracked its way inland along with the billowing gusts from the ocean and the serpents too that crawled toward shelter in intricate breaststrokes. Bald cypress and pine grew on ancient creek beds and Spanish moss hung from live oaks, trailing heavily in sweet water streams. Leeward, along treacherous shallow reefs, a ship followed a northwesterly coast, its sails at full rigging, the bow pointed toward the mainland. Twelve miles to the south, on the island's port city, a red house burned. The pride would make no return to the island. Its captain, Jean Lafitte, had been proclaimed a brigand. The great red house had been his, 
The entire Gallison settlement had been his, and he had torched it rather than give it over to the hard-following agents and hounding merchant marines of the New Americas. The ship he sailed was over 100 feet long and fast beyond belief, shallow drafted for mobility and stealth. It had been stripped of every bulkhead to make room for additional men and powder and outfitted with 16 cannons for killing. It maintained its northerly course through Galveston Bay, slackening its sails only when April Fool Point had been passed. At the mouth of Clear Creek, the anchor was dropped and over the side of the ship, a longboat was lowered, lowered into the water. Onto the longboat climbed Lafitte, followed by two men holding two chests filled with gold coins. They would row beyond Clear Creek into the heart of Middle Bayou. At sunset, Lafitte returned to the ship without the men and without the chests. By midnight, the pride was well on its way to the Tropic of Cancer, and the Yucatan that lay beyond it like a pale virgin sleeping reflecting the light of countless stars. Chapter two. The horse Ned rode out of Franklin on that morning had had a man's weight across its back only a few dozen times. It was a three-year-old gelding, narrow in the body and neck, with an ill-defined head that would have signaled to the unknowing or the inexperienced that the animal himself was as bland as his confirmation. In fact, he'd been given up for the sausage cart viewed as unreliable and intractable by the rangers of the westernmost outpost. Nate knew from the beginning that he had been assigned the horse as a joke, a test for the newly sworn in Texas State Policeman from Oklahoma. The gelding had been yanked at, whipped, blindfolded, and hobbled in an attempt to break him to the saddle, to the extent that even a tightened belly cinch sent the animal into frenzy bucking. When Nate saw the horse, head down, ears plowed backward, feet splayed. The first thing he did was remove the saddle, blanket, and bit, leaving only a lead rope around his neck. Nate stood by the gelding the remainder of the afternoon, occasionally feeding him a bit of grain and molasses, never looking directly at him, only following close as the animal grazed. The rangers, hoping for a show, had quickly gotten bored after the first hour and wandered away to see to their own affairs. The second morning, Nate hand fed the horse at regular intervals, touching him rhythmically and sweeping motions across his back and haunches, even removing his shirt to flag it gently across the horse's line of vision. By midday, there was not even a ripple of muscle across the gelding's chest when another ranger passed by. On the third day, Nate spent hours slipping the rope off and on the gelding's head and neck, snaking it across his withers, even draping it around his belly, tightening it only enough for the horse to feel the pressure. He fed the horse more grain and molasses, and the animal began to follow him around like a dog. On the morning of the fourth day, everyone in the entire ranger company who was not out on raid duty collected to watch Nate putting the blanket and saddle on that crazy gelding, who yielded quietly, even when the cinch was tightened. The onlookers braced expectantly for action when Nate put his foot in the stirrup, but he only leaned his weight across the saddle and then stepped down again. He repeated the action for half an hour before he fully seated himself. He touched his heels to the gelding and the horse bucked forward, but soon stopped and stood still, only his ears twitching. Nate got off and on the saddle a few more times, led him by the bridle, got back on, and tapped the horse into an easy canter away from the post. He was gone for 20 minutes, and when he returned, the gelding was lathered but calm. The rangers who had stood around making bets that the horse would come back riderless gave him backhanded compliments and pressed him for information on how to subdue their own uncooperative and clawed-footed mounts. When the captain, a veteran ranger by the name of Drake, asked him how he was able to break the horse, Nate shrugged and told him that working with a horse was like raising up a child. You build on trust and little tries, he said. At dawn on the fifth day, he was given the gilding, which would replace his own worn mount, and a commission to ride westward an hour distant to find two rangers in the field Captain George Deerling and Tom Goddard, and bring them back to Franklin. A killer named William McGill had reappeared in Houston after some absence from Texas to murderous effect. A man that Captain Deerling, for personal reasons, reasons Captain Drake did not elaborate on, had been chasing for years. Nate rode west for more than two hours until he saw the irregular bands of gray smoke from a campfire and came upon three men seated together in a companionable arrangement 
drinking coffee. If, it, if he hadn't seen the leg irons on the man sitting in the middle, he wouldn't have known which one was a prisoner and which ones were rangers. The only one smiling was the ankle-bound man, his hair poking up in unruly spikes as though he'd slept with a blanket pulled tight over his head. The rangers must have heard Nate coming from a long way off, otherwise they would have had their colts drawn and caught. He legged himself down from his horse and walked to the fire. You George Deerling, he asked. He addressed himself to the closest ranger, but the man shook his head and pointed to the older companion. From a middling distance, the two rangers looked remarkably alike, even beyond the sameness of their dress. Hatless, they both wore top boots over home sewn denim and shirts dyed in approximate indigo. The younger ranger was black haired with a black mustache, the edges of which drooped into his coffee cup, requiring him to make a backhanded sweep after every sip. The one he had pointed to was an older man, silver haired with a gray mustache, also of impressive width. Their hair was cropped serviceably short and every bit of exposed skin on the two rangers, wrists, necks, faces, and even the color of the eyes seemed sunblasted to a dunnish brown. The man sitting behind them was fully dressed in the same hard written way, but was bootless owing to the bulk of the leg irons. Nate shifted his good leg so he could stand more comfortably. His hip hurt something awful, but of a certainty he didn't want to appear weak limbed on his first field day. He said, I'm Nathaniel Cannon, Nate. There was no nod of assent or motion of recognition. He added, sent by Captain Drake. The last word lilted upwards and came out sounding to his ears like a question. The old ranger said, I'm George Deerling. My partner, he motioned sideways with his head, is Tom Goddard, Dr. Dom. The man in the middle said, and I'm the goddamn queen of the desert, he ducked and grinned, showing all his teeth top and bottom. Dearly, in a sweeping motion, brought his gun out of his holster and applied the butt of it sharply to the prisoner's head. Through the yowling protestations of foul play, Deerling said, this mannerless, mannerless yahoo is Maynard Collie. Dr. Tom set his cup down in motion for Nate to sit. You here to help us bring old Maynard in? Even the voices of the two rangers were the same, Nate thought, the top notes slightly breathy and clipped, like air exhaled in short, fibrous reeds. Dr. Tom smiled. You already missed the fun. Maynard here shot his own horse out from under himself, trying to ride and fire at us at the same time. Nate sat and fingered the dirt as if testing it. You know, you're awfully close to Las Cruces. We don't have power of arrest in New Mexico. He kept his voice neutral, but looked pointedly at Collie. Dr. Tom looked across the top of the prisoner who was still rubbing his head with both hands with an amused turn of his lips. George, did you know we was in New Mexico? Deerling drained the dregs of his cup. Still looks like Texas to me. <laughs> Bravo. Thank you. Bravo. That was terrific. Thank you, Kathleen. So next up, um, Loretta Diane Walker won the Phyllis Wheatley Book Award for Poetry for In This House. She was named Statesman in the Arts by the Heritage Council of Odessa. Her collection, Word Ghetto, won the Blue Light Press Book Award. Loretta has published five collections of poetry and her work has appeared in literary journals and anthologies in the United States, India, Canada, and the United Kingdom. Loretta? Thank you, Sergio, for setting this up. And I, I too want to say thank you to those who supported me. Um, I am I'm going to break protocol the way I, I use my first poem. I usually read is um, about my mother. Uh, in the middle of everything, um, I discovered that, um, well, I'm on my third round of breast cancer. I, I was deemed in remission in November, and I just found out three weeks ago um, that I'm in this battle again. And I wrote the poem, How to Fight Like a Girl, the first time that I was battling breast cancer. And I want to read that now, not only am I battling it, but I actually have friends that um, 
that are battling. So I want my first poem to be How to Fight Like a Girl. To fight like a girl, you must first become an ocean. To hold the crush of tears pooling beneath the ducts. You must learn to walk through the day with the fish of fear floating through the coral of your belly. At the sound of battle, you must paint your nails the boldest bloodshed of red and use them like shark teeth to maim and masticate those piranha emotions, knowing at your strength. You must get off your knees after the tentacles of cancer and chemo, nausea and fatigue, pain and weakness, Grasp your body and feed on all things woman. You must remember you are a woman. When lavas of sweat roll from your bald head and flank your face and your lips crack and flake like a dry beach, you must stand straight Wash yourself in softness. Tattoo stars on your fist and sing praises for the half moons in the sky of your breast. That was from In Your House. How to Fight Like a Girl. This next one I want to read is called Invitation. And this, this has a really special place. It's um, when I told Catherine about my recent diagnosis, she said, I'm going to, she sent me a poem she thought from one of the wisest people she knew. And one of the greatest gifts that you can receive as a poet when someone thinks that highly of you and they return the poem to you. So this is entitled Invitation. And this is for Catherine. Invitation. Come with me on this limb where grief is withering and the day is fresh with this lemon colored eye under the mantle of morning, a robin whistling, a golden retriever scratching his signature in the dew blotted dirt. A skirt of wind sails the tiny smile of a Calvin Klein model across the backyard fence. This is how healing comes in tiny, constant swirls. This it's how bad news comes. A message of terror is stuffed in the ears. Today, someone was told sickness is rolling in the veins of their blood river. Who is left holding sadness? This is how joy climbs up into the heart of one man and out of the mouth of another. I leave the door open so happiness can run in and out. When it is gone, I sit by the window waiting, waiting for its return. It's an invitation, that's for Catherine. And the small things are meaning much more to me now between the trips from the Oncology Center and home, I begin to look at the small things even more. And I wrote this poem called Variations on Glory. And this one has, this poem has a different meaning for me also. This is Variations on Glory. 
A tired wind rests in the clear lap of day. In the gentle arms of evening, old glory stars and stripes are still above the courthouse, its colors becoming shadows in the escaping light, its meaning radiant even in the growing darkness. How do we hang it from the poles of our hearts when the battle is not with steel or blade, rather with the struggle to reach for someone or something when turmoil is enemy? How does earth with all of its credentials decide which plaque to hang on its boundless walls? Isn't this glory? The throaty composition of hummingbirds, the delicate art of a field of wildflowers, the dew-soaked morning, and what of the season's revolving door? The way flames of autumn leaves scorch the horizon, how winter's cold skips the maple, the oak, and weeping mulberry. In their bare beauty, they exalt themselves with stiff raised branches. See the delight of the embarrassed grass when spring restores its yellow blades with green dignity. Isn't that glory? And for those of us born of woman, how do we rejoice in the frailty of our flesh? How do we meld our voices to amplify the volume of unity? What wild passion will make us blow the horn of reverie? Isn't this glory to fill the deep pond of our days with amazement? To feel the feathered breath of God and a handshake? And I would like to uh, read one more, and I want to read the title poem, Ode to My Mother's Voice. And the epigraph reads, another gift is a child's face in a dark room. Ode to My Mother's Voice. Each of our faces is a dark room in the house of her eyes. Her strangled whisper is a gift, even if she calls us by the wrong name. Her memory, a dissonant chord. My memory, a pew at St. James Baptist Church. Mama singing Amazing Grace. The congregation's crying, the lilt of her soprano voice a key to unlatch the cage of their tears. I fidget in my seat feet streaked with boredom. In my 12-year-old narcissism, I want the Jackson 5 to burn the mic with ABC, or I want you back. Melodies that can dry tears, make the hymnal stiff hands clap. Mama's voice is common as Dawn's blooming hues. She's the radio we listen to before she cleans enough houses to buy a Motorola. She packs Aretha Franklin tunes in her handbag, carries them to work, brings them home in the evening. Bridge over troubled water is her anthem for tuna casserole. Now, I'm the one who works hard. I beg, open your eyes, mama. Hold my hand. Speak to me. An ambulance emergency light split the darkness. I inhale, walk into the night where luminous stars hang from the gallery of sky. A nurse tells me to breathe. I can't exhale until hospital instruments stop improvising her heartbeat, until her voice is an ostinato of life. Thank you. Wow, that was terrific and, and very powerful. And, and Loretta, I, I wanna say this, um, I'm sure it's true for many of the people here, 
you know, we're, 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 we're your community. So if you need something or if you somehow just want to chat, all you have to do is pick up the phone and I, I certainly will chat with you and, and talk to you. Um, you know, we want to help you in any way you, you can. And I'm going to mention this because my wife allows me to mention this. Uh, but, you know, she's battled it twice, breast cancer. So we, we sort of understand what you're going through a little bit and, and just know that we're here and, and we want to help and we want to just listen to you. And that was very powerful. I love listening to your poetry. Thank you. So um, I don't see Dan. I think Dan confirmed, but Dan Williams, uh, who was to be next, I don't see him. So I, maybe he, Steve, do you know where Dan is? <laughs> no, we don't know where Dan is. So I'm going to just skip him and we're going to go right to Bill Wright. Um, so Bill, Bill Wright won the Southwest Book Award for his first book, The Tiguas, Pueblo Indians of Texas. And again, for the most recent authentic Texas, People of the Big Bend, a collaboration with one of my favorites, Marsha Hatfield, Dot is Still. Bill's photographs reside in many public and private collections, including the British Library in London, the National Museum of Art in Washington, DC, and the Harry Ransom Humanities Research Center at the University of Texas at Austin. Bill, it's all yours. We can't hear you. Not at all here. There you go. You yeah, we can hear you now. Uh, first, I want to thank everyone that voted for me. I'm amazed at the bravery of this uh, group to uh, have a person uh, like me in the uh, midst of you. But uh, I am deeply grateful and uh, certainly an honor. And uh, I'd like to read just a little bit out of my last book, The Whole Damn Cheese, which is a uh, sort of a biography of a frontier woman down in the Big Ben who uh, made a life for herself and was quite a character. Um, I'm gonna start it um, in the prologue a little bit uh, uh, and then we'll get into maybe a, a few stories better. In April of 1965, Maggie had come to Alpine several days before with a severe pain uh, in her stomach, but no one expected so sturdy a, a woman to pass so suddenly. Uh, Maggie was always a healer, not a picture. She nursed sick babies and drew poison from rattlesnake bitten legs. What was a little pain in the stomach? But it was a big pain and persisted. And shortly before dawn on Thursday, April the 8th, Maggie suddenly died. The news of her death spread quickly. Services were held Saturday, April the 10th barely giving an opportunity for those living far away to attend. The pastor of the church, Reverend Robert Bristol, spoke to the crowd in a hushed voice. Dramatic shafts of colored light passed through the small array of windows high above the pews. He spoke of the many aspects of Maggie's life. Healer, midwife, caregiver, foster parent, arbitrator. He did not mention that Maggie was also a gadfly, a smuggler, uh, a constant obstacle to the bureaucratic needs of the National Park Service. Of course, the pastor didn't have to mention those things because everyone in attendance was well aware of Maggie's activities. At the conclusion of Bristol's words honoring the woman, Ida Mae Williams played a quiet hymn on the organ, and Rex Ivey Jr., Maggie's former business partner, led the other pallbearers before the open casket, pausing slightly as he passed, then walking to waiting cars outside. The congregation rose in a, in a single line, streamed past the casket, 
viewing the now relaxed expression of the strong, stocky woman whose face so shortly before had been taught to pain. The Mexicans from across the Rio Grande had gathered wildflowers as they walked along the desert trails, and as they passed the open cagnet, placed them around Maggie, framing the strong and resilient features of her face with color. At the graveside, the wind came up again, and the pastor said in a few final words, uh, the visitors mingled with family members, and everyone quickly uh, dispersed. The Catholic, the casket was lowered and covered with gray alluvial dirt by the cemetery workers. Maggie's death marked the close of an era that will not be seen again. In the years that followed, many stories of Maggie's actions in life were recalled by authors writing about the Big Ben, but as the years pass, most of those in Maggie's immediate family have died. First-hand knowledge of this remarkable woman is being lost. This book is an attempt to bring together in one place many of the stories regarding Maggie Smith, along with new research about her family and life uh, along the Big Bend of Texas border, the nation's last frontier. Psychologists tell us that the characteristics of people are determined by nature and nurture. Maggie Smith is no exception. Her forebears made their mark in the history of Texas and their genes and personalities contributed to the formation of her way of life. Maggie was born with a heritage of strong and adventurous men and women and nurtured by their love for each other in a largely hostile environment. Her story is one of resilience, courage, and common sense with her personal needs tempered by empathy and compassion. Maggie Smith stands out as one of several women who as circumstances dictated were strong enough to survive and even prosper in the wild and primitive Chihuahuan desert of far west Texas. Now I will uh, uh, give you a little uh, taste of uh, what it was like. Uh, this is a story uh, uh, in the book here. And it, I'll just read the last part of it. It says, even though Maggie continued to keep a house in Alpine until her death, she spent most of her time working along the river. For a while, Maggie had a little washateria in Alpine, but that didn't last very long. Uh, and she moved her river operations to a little store at a railroad switch in Quebec. Uh, that's a little community between Martha and Valentine. At that time, Valentine was a dry, uh, was a, uh, Valentine was dry, and there was money to be made with a bar and a beer joint located just across the river line in Presidio County. One evening, as she slept in the back room of the bar, she awoke to a racket in front. Thinking the noise sounded like a cash register being opened, she got her 38 pistol, went into the front room to find a young man doing just that. She drew down on him and marched him out of the front door and asked where he was from. The man said he was from a parked train about 200 yards away, and she said, how fast can you get back on it? The young man smarted off to Maggie, saying, I don't have to move fast to get back on that train. Well, I'm going to help you along, Maggie replied, firing a shot between his feet. He quickly changed his attitude and started running toward the train. Maggie shot five more times at his feet as he ran. When the train made its next stop in Marfa, the man was apparently 
was apprehended and brought to a swift trial and Maggie was called to testify. Her son, Brian, drove her to court. When she was on the witness stand, attorney Bruce Sutton described the events to the jury and came to the part where she had shot between his legs. What did he do, he asked. He sure didn't stop to pick no daisies, Maggie said, and Bruce and the entire courtroom broke down in laughter. The jury gave a guilty verdict and settled, sentenced the man to 10 years in prison. He came from a well-to-do family in El Paso and with his family's influence, he had always escaped punishment. But in Marfa, there wasn't any way he was gonna get out of serving time. Everybody left the courtroom. Maggie and Byron were at the door visiting with Bruce as the young man was led out of his way, on his way to jail. He paused in front of Maggie and said, I'll tell you what, Miss Smith, maybe you stop me in time. Maybe I'll be a better person next time. So that's one example of some of the stories. Uh, but I wanted to also read a little piece about uh, something that happened to me during interviews for uh, this book. Uh, in 2017, I was doing a few final interviews uh, for my Maggie Smith book and called on a man who lives in Alpine, hoping he had some firsthand information that would document, document the house he lived in as being purchased from Maggie. And by the way, this piece is going to uh, be in a memoir that I'm writing uh, with a lot of stories. Um, it was Sunday morning and I drove from my house in Fort Davis, arriving at his address about 11.30 a.m. As I walked to the front door, two small dogs appeared in the windows and began a vigorous yapping, a good indicator the house was occupied. I rang the bell, only intensified the two dog uh, volume, no human response. At this point, I noticed the door had a locked clasp. I had already observed the neighborhood looked pretty rough, with a lot of abandoned cars in the yards and junk piled around. Obviously, the occupants had left, probably the church. The security was, uh, must have been always on their mind. At, uh, as it was near noontime, I decided to leave the barking dogs and get a bit of lunch myself. I took my time returning to the house about an hour later. From the street, I could see that the cask was now unlocked and someone would surely be there. I got out with my shoulder bag with recorder and camera, notebook, business cards with my bona fides listed on the back. Uh, bona fides meaning my published book. My name and contact information on the front. I was prepared to ask for an interview and I wanted to see the professional. There was a quick response to my knock and a friendly looking woman gave me a quick appraisal. Is Mr. Ripley available, I asked. She invited me inside, closed the door and went to fetch her husband. The two dogs stopped barking but circled me, ready to respond to any false move on my part. Shortly, Ms. Ripley returned with her husband and I explained the project I was researching inquired about the ownership of the house prior to their occupancy. We moved that house here, he said. There's no house, there was no house on this lot when we purchased it. Dead end, I thought. Then he continued, I remember Miss Smith. The two boys lived in the house behind us and I turned that into a tool chip. Well, all was not lost. Could I visit with you about the boys, I asked. Sure, he said, let's sit on the couch. Two hours later, I said, I must leave, and I really enjoyed uh, meeting the uh, folks, hearing stories about Maggie and her family, and asked permission to photograph the house. As I was leaving, I asked both of them if they wouldn't mind to step outside with the dog so I could take their picture. And they readily agreed and each with the dog in their arms followed me in the front yard while I pulled out my camera and snapped away. 
And I had a little picture here, if you all can see it. Uh, that's a, a picture of the couple and two dogs. We said our goodbyes, and as I started to get in the car, Charlene called out and asked, I want to ask you a favor. She said, do you have an old pair of those hiking boots you're wearing that I could have? <laughs> God, I was startled. No one had ever asked me that kind of a question before. I looked down at my size 14 Merrill hiking shoes with the Super Greg Vibram soles that constituted my favorite footwear. And I asked, why in the world would you want them? I want to put them on my front porch. She said, put them on my front, put them on your front porch. I, I laughed in disbelief. Yeah, she said, laughing and waving goodbye. Ain't nobody brave enough to break in this house when they see them damn shoes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it is. You get a funny story or a tragic story every time you make an interview. Do I have time for one more? I think you do, Bill. I love hearing you read. Well, even though, I'll, here's another one. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, let me find it here. All right. Uh, Maggie moved around a bit, uh, and she moved over to a, a place uh, across the river and uh, had a bar, and that it really serviced a lot of miners that were in Mexico mining uh, uh, minerals. And they were shipping them across, back across the river to the United States and on to, to uh, uh, New York. But uh, I'll read about this. Even in this new environment, Maggie retained her love for people of all kinds and looked after their illnesses and their accidents. Bill Ivey, uh, who was her partner, uh, remembered an incident when she used frontier medicine to cure a minor of hiccups. He had the hiccups for days and was completely worn out from hiccuping, just sitting around complaining. Maggie kept saying, I can cure you. So finally one day during his hiccup spell, he was sitting on the front porch and she walked out of the store real quiet stood behind him and took a 45 and stuck it over his head and let off a round. I was sitting there, Bill Ivy said, like to blew him off the porch. He gathered himself up and said, May, what the hell are you doing? She said, you got the hiccups? He said, my, my gosh, I don't. She cured him whether he wanted it or not. <laughs> and that's it. Bravo. Bravo. Thank you, Bill. That was terrific. I'm glad I was recording. It'll be up in, on YouTube for posterity. So I wanted to thank uh, all of you for, for uh, the wonderful reads. And uh, I feel like, you know, we're kind of a little closer to each other, even though we're far away. And we're going to do this again two weeks from today, same time, 4 p.m. Central. And I'll see if I can corral Dan Williams to not get messed up with the, the time zones. Uh, I'm guessing he, he has a different time zone. Uh, but thank you very much. I'm going to stop recording and I'll just sort of uh, hang around in case people want to chat.